Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ventures Wednesday webinar, which covers today Material Editor Basics. Well, Ventures and First is capable of handling um, IBL, so image based lighting, and therefore we can work with standard textures like a diffuse and specular texture and stuff like that. But we also support new terms. And they are called like um, base color. We have things like the roughness map and all the things which are commonly used in the PBR techniques. But do please do not mix up the PBR and the IBL engines. We are still an IBL engine, image-based lighting engine, instead of a physical-based rendering engine. We are compatible to uh, these workflows and the textures and they look and feel the same way like a PBR texture in the end. So um, we support both workflows, the metalness and the roughness workflow. I will go into deep um, about these two different things soon. Um, but for the basic understanding, for example, this cube, how this cube is created, uh, it needs several texture stages. We call them texture stages in the material editor um, to achieve this result we see here on the screen. This one is using HDR as the layer type. So the engine is switched over to an HDR engine, high dynamic range engine. And uh, by doing so, we are enabling a, a part of our engine which is capable of handling higher dynamic ranges, which is important to create things like glows, lens flares, stuff like that. And also in the end, the color itself will look slightly different to a standard engine, to a standard SD engine. So another very important thing about an, uh, enabling HDR is that you're capable of shifting lights and also the emissive, especially the emissive channel into a higher dynamic range to have this kind of bloom effect um, enabled for only certain parts of the whole geometry or in this case of this uh, texture. Um, because I'm telling now the emissive texture on this cube to be around 1000 or 10,000 percent in the amount and that shifts the whole texture uh, into a high dynamic range and therefore creating this glare or bloom effect. We call it bloom. When you have a look here in the properties field, you see that I enabled bloom and by adjusting and you see a small, tiny amount, about 2%. And whenever I enable that and uh, set it to a higher amount, you see that only these parts are starting to bloom or things that are near or in the higher dynamic range like this uh white here by the way this environment texture you see here is also an hdr image which is applied uh on the on the skybox section here um i can move and rotate it and you see that this skybox is made by a simple uh elements like a point here to, to emit light the white window styles and a bit of a um, yeah, let's call it a semisphere or hemisphere. And uh, yeah, this things emit light and therefore you have these reflections and stuff like that on this cube. And another thing to take notice is that I have disabled the default light for this uh, whole layer. So that takes away the default light we have set in the scene. So usually when you move around your camera inside of Ventus without having added any light, um, you have a headlamp like, uh, which is flowing uh, above your head and pointing towards uh, the direction of the camera. And therefore you have a bit of default light then happening. So whenever I have a new scene, I create an axis on cube here. You see that we have uh, light already applied to, to, to this uh, cube. Uh, in this case, I'm using the free flight camera and this light is not attached to the free flight camera. Therefore, do not wonder that you don't have, don't see light right now here. So anyway, and when I switch now on the layer here on the layer 3D route, 
the default light to have none, you really have no light, but you see that we have the cube there, but it's not lit because we don't have any light in the scene. Um, another thing is which you should take notice of is whenever you have another default light uh, enabled and you set a point light or directional or spotlight or whatever light into the scene, it quickly jumps over and uses then this one point light, yeah? So which is now exactly in the middle and the coordinates are zero, zero, zero. So when I move it away like this here, you see um, the light, the cube is affected by the point light right now, also by the range parameters and stuff like that. More to that later. Um, so the default light is now switched off and another light takes over. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you create a secondary light that it switches the first light off and then to the next. No, 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 you have now uh, two lights in the scene, which is nice. Um, right now, the maximum amount of lights per element, per phase is eight. Um, this limitation can be, uh, let's say, mm, we have a workaround for that. So if you need more lights in the scene, you would use uh, something like called like lighting group and put all the lights into a lighting group and saying you don't want to inherit the lights coming from outside. So uh, the objects which are now in this lighting group um, are just affected by these lights and then you have a secondary lighting group. And the other objects, other elements inside of that group where you can have again eight lights and stuff like that. So, and whenever you decide to say, I want to inherit the lights outside of lighting group, that will add these lights to these lighting groups, but keep in mind that the lights which are outside of this lighting group um, count as one light. So in this case, if you inherit this light from with together with this one, you already have now three lights. And when you have uh, another light in here in this group and you inherit here, you have now two lights because this is one light and this is a secondary light. Uh, but apart from that, it's like, these two lights are not affecting here, just as a side note. So this is a good way to get control over the lighting situation. But um, with the workflow I'm gonna show you today, it's more like you can work around lighting, especially dynamic lighting in Ventus when you have pre-baked textures. So, um, and on top you can have the dynamic lights used with that. And there is a special thing you need to understand and to see and to live life um, uh, that you know how to handle these things and these textures. This is the reason why we have this uh, webinar today to give you some hints and tricks, which usually costs you a lot of money because I would teach you that in three days. Usually you get a material training, which leads at least three days, um, but I can keep talking for five days, don't worry, um, <laughs> which is a big topic. So this cube, back to this cube, we have this cube here. Um, and this cube is made out of several material stages. We have a material node, and inside of this node, you can uh, layer more or less different kind of texture stages. So these stages um, do have an order on one hand. They may have an order, better to say that, um, but they can also be totally um, random, more or less, yeah? So the order plays a matter whenever you are using functions like multiplying, adding textures on top of another texture. So when I say multiplying and adding, I mean really the uh, things you do in Photoshop, the blending modes, so that you blend base color on top of another base color on top of another base color, and you use pin light to highlight certain accents of these combinations uh, of textures and so on. Therefore, we have these um, operators uh, inside of the stages. But generally, it's like whenever you click on this texture, uh, on this material here, this is the one material for this cube, you see we have one, two, three, four, five, six textures. But these textures, except the very first two ones, are all individual textures. They go into individual channels. So the first channel we are using is the base color. Why it is not a diffuse channel? Simply and very easily to explain is that this is, a, whenever you have wood or 
you imagine you have a, um, a container which is painted with uh, some kind of uh, uh, color and uh, or, or this glossy paint you you have the base color and on top there is glossiness and rust and stuff like that but the base color is really the color that identifies the basics of the surface um, we do not talk about the reflections right now, which comes from the glossiness or from the specularity or whatever else. We just talk about the colors. So if you imagine, imagine and you go to the lowest level of a wooden table, for example, this will be brown. Simple and easy brown. Maybe a solid brown, maybe with some kind of uh, slight variations because of the beans or something like that. But the base color should be brownish. And you will wonder how different these real base colors of materials are compared to the things you see in the end when the wool um, uh, layers are compact and completed. So what really hits your eye is completely different to that what the surface is in in the very first base so we have this base color this base color is let's say very bright on one hand but when you look at this cube it's way darker and that's what i meant um since you add some more textures and specific uh properties of this material um you change also the overall look and the color of this cube of this base cube color um, which looks in first here for us very very strong orangish but when you have a look at this base color it's more like well is the gamma not correctly adjusted you know so therefore it's more brighter it has way more gain inside and yeah that's the reason why uh, you need to understand that the true color of an element in the games industry when you create and also for the real-time graphics we create here so uh, compared it to this uh, to, to games as well to game engines they work the same if they are using IBL and PBR um, the, the base color has a completely different color than you expect it to have so it's like you have color cards sometimes when you take photos of elements you put the color card aside to identify the real color of this element you are taking a picture of so when you remodel that you use the color card as a reference and then you check what kind of real color do i have what's the saturation what's the rgb value and so on and so on um yeah this is completely different to them what you expect the end result should look like so um this happens in the game industry a lot in the beginning of the ibl and pbr textures that the artists the three artists 3d artists and graphic artists like me started to create textures the old traditional way like the diffuse using a diffuse texture uh, and in the end the old textures appear too dark because they said the original color they wanted to have in the end result like a really really cool fruity orange and that was the result was it was in the end like oh going into the brownish color because it gets really dark because of the other layers added on top and also take uh, the, the light lighting has to be taken into account so you have an hdr map that lights the the cube in the end or the object and therefore you don't have always constant light yeah or just like point light which goes around and has a constant color so therefore this is a bit different to, uh, difficult to understand in the first whenever you switch over to work with HDR, PBR, IBL stuff. Um, and there are good things, um, resources which you can uh, uh, grab and say, get some information from. And this is, for example, uh, from Mamoset Toolbag. They have set up a nice web page and also cool tutorials it's based on the tutorials tool back there you can find a part which is called physical based rendering and you can too this explains uh very good how these uh material layers and all these things are working um they call it all the albedo um albedo is exactly the same as a base color it's just another term so 
Uh, I said in the beginning, yeah, it is easily easy to explain the difference between a base color and the and and the diffuse channel. Um, okay, let's go back to that. A diffuse channel had already structure informations in the texture, in the flat texture painted into, like um, these carvings of a tile, for example, or a bit stuff from, from a brick wall, uh, even if you use a normal map, map in the end, but you also had already um, the informations for uh, the thin lines here, a bit of the structure and so on of, of uh, the brick wall, which we don't have here in the base texture. Yeah, um, you, you don't see anything from the rust, uh, from, from the structure of the rust. You see the colors of the rust we have here on the cube, uh, but you don't see the real structuring of it, yeah, you know? So this is the difference of a base texture and the diffuse texture. So back to this post or to this tutorial thingy, um, this is a good hint. You should read through that. You, you see also the differences between these both work workflows. I will explain them as well now. Um, you get an idea about Fresnel. You see the cavity and AO maps explained and stuff like that. Um, this is a good thing to start with whenever you want to understand materials and get an idea about the workflow uh, of PBR and IBL. So, I said there is a difference between metalness and specularity. This will come later when we come to this texture here. We have now the base color. The base color colorizes the cube, basically. Then we have the normal map, which is um, yeah, creating the old school bump effect, but from a right position of the light perspective, more or less. Um, then we have the specularity map. And now we come to the point where I said, okay, what's the difference between the metalness and the specular workflow? Um, it was difficult at the beginning when we started with IBL and PBR and stuff like that. And uh, there was no industry standard to say, hey, okay, artist, you have to go that workflow and it looks exactly like we want to have a realistic material. That wasn't possible. Every, everyone was cooking his own soup and stuff like that. So the one decided to do that this way, the other one decided another way. And we had, in the end, we had six, seven, several ways to, to create a realistic looking texture. Um, but we sat together with substance guys from a long time called Allegro Rhythmic. Nowadays, they are bought up by Adobe. Um, with the substance guys who sat together and had to talk together. We sat together a bit with the Marmoset tool guys, the tool set guys. Um, we followed these both directions and found out that their definitions and their workflow seems to be a good one, to be honestly. And therefore we, um, yeah, we tried to sum up every si everything from them and put that in our engine um, using the same values, how to handle the lighting calculations and stuff like that. And the result was very good. And therefore we can now present to you that Ventus is capable of handling the substance painter created textures, the baked textures, as well as the designer created design substances. So you can expect to have them look exactly like in uh, a substance designer and substance painter depending on the environment. I did a lot of tests. I tell you, the last some years, I did a lot of tests. I did a lot of tweaks together with the development team to make sure that it really looks exactly like it should. And as long as you are using the exactly same environment textures and the exact textures used in substance, you have the same look and feel. If you use a different kind of HDR background image, for example, it looks differently because of the background image, right? So, but you can expect to have the exact same result, behavior, look and feel if you follow up the standard workflows. Metalness and specular workflow. So if you have a look here, you may see more or less good that we have a specularity texture which contains also colors. It's not just a grayish texture. It is a grayish texture, yes, but it has here colors. So. The difference between a metalness workflow and the specular workflow is shown up here. If you have a look at the albedo map, this albedo map 
um, is at certain parts black, like this one here for the specular workflow, while for the metalness workflow, this part is white or has a color. Yeah. So the same goes here for this aperture, for the ring and stuff like that. Uh, you see that here, this overall texture is more, way more dark in all areas compared to the albedo map. When we have a look at the specular map, it's like the specular map contains colors, which are here in the albedo map, but not on the specular workflow albedo map. And the metalness workflow has no real specular map, but a metalness map. So the idea behind is when you are following the specular workflow, it's like the specular light that hits the surface and got reflected is then also colorized by the specular map. That means the intensity of the kind of reflection uh, is defined by the brightness of the specularity, but also the color, which is common for these copper rings or for metal parts, yeah, but especially color, uh, this, this color on these uh, copper rings or for gold or for whatever else is defined by the specular map. This information is lacking here in the albedo map. This is like a diffuse color. This is just colors. While following the metalness workflow, it is everything in the albedo map and the metalness map decides to say, this is rubber plastic or whatever. The rest got the, the roughness is defined by the roughness map in the end. And this bright ones here is metal. So in this case, it gets really, 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 really cool from the reflection side. The reflections are not tinted and stuff like that. So this is the difference between the metalness and the specular workflow. For an artist, keep in mind, it is easier to follow up the specular workflow. Since me as a 3D or 2D or whatever else artist, it's easier to understand when I'm working on a specular texture that whenever I colorize a specular part of a texture, I can be sure that the reflection or the specular reflection is at least in that color. While it is hard to grab to work with the metalness map. Another disadvantage is when using a metalness map, the transition between, um, especially when you have scratches on it, which uh, go down onto the metal la layer, yeah. So keep in mind, this is an uh, aluminium uh, s uh, stuff coated with rubber or something like that. And you do a big scratch in it, then you see the bare metal on one side, but on the other side you have it coated with rubber, which is a non, <laughs> which is a non, sorry, which is a non-metallic uh, object. And the transition between these both types of materials. Um, looks a bit fuzzy. That's the difference you have. While using specular and albedo uh, workflows, you can be sure that these between these transitions it will not happen because you don't have it. You, the, the, the shader is not deciding to, yes, switch over to metalness, work, uh, uh, metalness and no, do not use metalness. So um, yeah, this, this, this small details may affect the result. So it's two points for the specular instead of the metalness workflow in this case. But Ventus can handle both. So don't worry. If you have a tool or program or whatever else that works and spits out only the metalness workflow, you can use the metalness workflow. Uh, Ventus will give it best, the best uh, to show and uh, show the visual result uh, as, as close and perfect as it should be. Okay, specular texture done. We have ambient occlusion, which is, as you probably know, um, a nice detailed texture you set on top of a base color to uh, create areas or have areas in the material which really never get really lit because they are very, very tight. It's like um, when you have two walls hitting each other uh, in the corners, you have an ambient occlusion because the light bounces so fast that it looks for the eyes, for our perception, it's like it's getting dark. That's the truth mathematics behind. So um, two white walls, which create a corner, um, have bouncing light in between of the corner that goes so fast that it looks like 
black for us. And this is uh, mathematically that that's or physically this is then the ambient occlusion map. And uh, it's nice to have these textures sometimes also already multiplied in a software like Photoshop or something like that and uh, on top of the base color. So you can save a material channel, by the way, or a material stage by having this ambient occlusion baked already into the base, depending on if it's um, yeah, uh, a dynamic stuff, you should avoid that. Um, okay, roughness. Roughness is another point which is quite interesting, especially when we move closer to the cube. You can see that we have parts where we see real glossy reflections and we have parts which looks like they had someone left his fingerprint on and this roughness maps are controlling this behavior how the reflections from the environment look on the soft surface for example the screws have nearly no roughness and therefore they are looking really glossy then we have uh, here this rust this rust is very uh, let's say um, yeah dry and therefore we don't have glossiness on this areas where we have this rust and this roughness map is like i said controlling this behavior okay so uh nothing goes without roughness especially when you have a look this opens the grid uh especially when you have a look here at this part where we have some reflection from this bright area uh, white light you see that it is controlled by the roughness on one hand the color of the reflection is still done by the specular map. Okay, so here cube, please unfold. Then we have the emissive channel in the end, which is a plain black texture, depending on where you want to have bright areas, like um, I used some kind of paint uh, which is uh, like drops on, on the cube or something like that to create this kind of mask. Um, usually this is just uh, bluish. So let me disable the bloom and you see this texture is just made of bright blue spots and some spots scattered around. But as soon as I enable the lens flares and the bloom, you see that this th thing starts to glow. Here you see that barely inside of the image-based lens. Whenever I rise up the amount now, you see that the glow gets even brighter. Why is it that this texture is not that bright as here? Simply because I said it so. So um, when we have a look inside of the material of this cube, you may notice that this emissive is now set to 15,000% of the amount. I'm going to show you now how to use this um, as an advantage to control the, um, the, the, the glow elements, the bloom element um, parts of your rendering. The very first thing you need to know to do is enabling the engine to use HDR. That's the very first thing we do. I create an axis and a sphere, which creates now a simple sphere here on the screen. I'm changing the scaling like this, and I enable now the bloom. You see that this part here, which is bright, which is apparently white, 255, 254, and 4, um, nearly white, but at least it's white, um that this white part is taken already by the shader um, to create this bloomish effect when i now change the threshold to zero you see that anything that goes a bit brighter than black is taken into account to create this bloom effect this is okay this is fine by adjusting the amount I'm telling it to really use only these last three percent and bloom that once. So when I'm moving here, you see we have a slight bloom here, a very slight one, 
but it's still not enough to be taken into account for the bloom shader to react properly on that. Even here where we have this white specular highlight, you don't have much bloom here. So we can go even lower like 0.3% and the bloom is like off. What I can do now is create a secondary sphere. I just make it a bit tinier like standard scaling. I put that one now aside. And I'm creating now a material node. I set this material to have a Fong material. I unfold it by right clicking on that, or you can use this arrow. Just check everything is white and blah. Then I'm creating a color stage. And I'm telling this color stage that the target here is a selection where you can set targets and so on is now the emissive. As you see, it looks like you would have set this to no light. That's correct. It's like the emissive channel is just plain white and that's fine. But like I said in the beginning, I can tell now the amount of this emissive to be something like 100,000. Et voila. You see that thing is now glowing. I'm reducing that by one zero and it gets a bit dimmed but still we have a glow you see that this 0.3 percent of amount of blue is enough to use this source as a bloom so whenever we change the color you see that the bloom is also changing its color So let me get rid of all these things like the base color and the speculum, that we have the pure emissive color on it. What I did change now is that I have a pure red and exactly 255.0.0 value .0 now typed it. Whenever I change this, it may happen that these color values are multiply that much that the result is a more wide source uh, a sphere here and you still see the colorized ring. This may happen if you use a too high value. At a certain point it may be just white but you, you, the halo around that one uh, is still colorized. So keep that in mind. This is like a bleeding you, you create there. So this is the first thing to understand how the HDR stuff here, the bloom has to be used and how it's working. Then we have on top, we have the image-based lens flare. It's the same thing, you have to keep in mind that. It's the same thing like with the bloom. We use the default, you see how bright that shit is. Right? But what you do is then you adjust the um sorry where we are here you adjust the threshold to zero that everything get filtered but you set the amount to 0 0.1 and then you see that just the really really bright things which are on the highest dynamic range affect the the these lens flare oh i hear that from far away ah the same goes for the halo sites, adjust the halo sites to be, be a bit bigger, change this loader to be a gradient, use this rainbow gradient in first, switch it over to have it not vertical, shift these guys to be a bit tighter together, same goes for the reddish color, and change the beginning to black. So therefore, you don't have this disturbing uh, lens flare in the middle, from the halo, but the rest works fine. Another thing to be adjusted is the filter. So I give you some default and a hint how you should really properly use uh, the lens flare the current parameters. The blurring is about 11%. Uh, 11%. Um, the rest should be fine right now. Um, play around a bit with the halo size because sometimes 
these halos got too close to the center of uh, the origin of the uh, the uh, lens flare and this looks okay yeah so whenever you have a secondary sphere position that somewhere on the screen i mean these tips are worth gold by, by the way um if you just change the color to have it white so and you see we have now two nice lens flares one green one white physically this is correctly working by the way so and there you go and you have nice halo on lens flares applied on the dirt mask you can disable this dirt mask to get rid of my default map i created for you like fingerprints and the dirt on the lenses um, you can lower the values the amount and stuff like that so this is a bit of the basic stuff for understanding how we get emissive stuff how we get glow into the scene like this one here um, you can imagine that the same goes for textures so whenever you have instead of an emissive channel color channel you can use a texture set it per default as an emissive texture you can also go for a base color for a base texture in this case yeah and then here is the target for the color here is the target for the alpha so what should ventures do with the color channel of this black and white texture it goes into the base node no the target is the emissive. So now this checkerboard pattern is taken into the emissive channel. White is bright, black is dark. The amount is now 1000. You see it starts glowing. Whenever you rise that up to 10,000, for example, it glows more and more and more. There you go, and your checkerboard is glowing. Doesn't matter what kind of texture you use. Uh, if there is any colorized information in it, it will use the colorized informations. So let me use this distort texture. You see, even that one is working. Let's remove the digit. There you go. So this is how the texture stages and the textures basically work in Ventus. I have skipped for a reason the part how you get a standard texture in Ventus, how you get a video in Ventus, how you get all these things into Ventus. I've skipped these parts because I think there are enough tutorials and there are enough things online where you can find this kind of really, really, really basic information. As I would have changed the um, the topic for this webinar to the most very, very basic uh, material editor things. So I think it's more important for you to get some tics, tips and tricks. For example, you can create such environments quite easily by using your own 3D software. Um, the idea is to use for example, Cinema 4D or 3ds Max, you create your environment, you create a light environment, uh, the daylight system um, that throws shadows and stuff like that. Uh, my preferred personal software is 3ds Max, and I'm using several renderers. Um, basically, I'm working with 3ds Max without plugins at all. Um, because I'm using this software then more, for more than 30 years right now, um, starting from 3DS and DOS. And I'm working without plugins, but for what I'm using plugins is really for the renderer. So um, we're using, sometimes I'm using Arnold, I'm sometimes using uh, V-Ray. Uh, there are dozens more, Mental Ray, for example. I'm using all these renderers depending on the projects or the idea I'm following. And then I'm creating such guys here, like these gallery objects, uh, things like that. So we have uh, nice lighting, um, a cool situation where you can position and place objects. I combine them with simple mirror glass effects from Ventus. We have something in the sky, like here, this window. And as you see, I'm using a lot of Bloom. I love Bloom. Um, which is a pain in the ass for my boss. <laughs> he says always it's too much blue, but 
can never be enough bloom in a scene when you are using that correctly and have time to tweak that to a decent level. So uh, you see here also we have the reflection on the ground. Uh, the same goes for the bright areas we have here in the corner and stuff like that. So this is it's quite easy to get these results done and into Ventus. Let me have a look. I have one more thing I wanted to show you. This is the concrete room. So while it is loading, the room is done in 3ds Max. It's basic, very simple, quickly created room. Uh, I think just an hour or something like that to go out the cubes and ex expand and extend all the things, cut out some elements from the top of the ceiling. And whenever you move around, you're gonna see that we have uh, this situation here. So it's nothing big. Um, it's just a simple room. Yeah, we have here the windows. Uh, we have the ceiling. I cut out the, the areas for the ceiling. Um, what else did I do? Uh, yeah, we have the lighting situation. Uh, the lighting situation is indeed a daylight system. On top of the daylight system, I'm using, uh, by the way, I'm using the renderer in this case. I'm using Arnold lights, and the Arnold lights are portals. So um, these portals are good for transmitting the light from the outside down into a closed area. I'm using a physical-based camera. The cameras have settings to set the intensity and all that stuff. So this is a pre-render of this area, um, of this shot, uh, which is done quickly, quite quickly. Um, I have the advantage that I have enough performance, so we have around 64 processors running here on the system. So this pre-rendering is uh, done quite quickly for this quality. So and what I did use on top is so-called um, the flat iron. I'm using flat iron to render out different kind of maps and bake the textures. Um, and also to have the textures split up um, by having a complete map, the lighting map, the uh, shadow maps, um, different kind of specular maps and stuff like that, which is quite handy because you can stitch and put them all together and then just later on you have full control over the, the stuff. Um, this is the result after I've tweaked some stuff. So uh, we have now these textures for the pillars, for the walls, and for the ceiling. Uh, we, we have them all imported into Ventus. Um, these are single texture. Okay, these are three textures in the end. It's a base texture, it's a normal map, and a specularity, and this counts for every material. One thing you have not when using simple import of these textures as a base color, for example, I've done that for here. Yeah, let's select the wall, slide two. Um, this texture is the complete map. It has everything inside of this map, except the normal maps and the specularity. Um, that means we have the shadows and all that stuff inside. Um, the advantage is it's quickly done. You can use a high res texture. You have only one of these high-res textures in memory. Um, it goes quick, fast. It's not affecting the, the performance that much. We have several scenes open, by the way. And I'm working right now here on this machine on this very, very uh, um, low 9080. So basically, it doesn't matter how big this room is. You can have uh, nice textures on it. And uh, it should be enough for a VR set or something like that. But there is one special thing, and this is uh, about these reflections on the ground and especially on the shadows of this Ventus cube we have rotating here. Don't worry about this corner. This is an artifact from the modeling. So, but in the end, it's okay. It's quite nice. You see, yeah, nice reflection. Not too bright, not too much, not too clear, and stuff like that. So let's have a look at the floor. 
The floor is a basic mirror, a flat mirror, a flat fact mirror. Um, what I've done here, basically the default settings, except the amount, I lowered a bit the amount and that's it. So we can have it less blurred, but then it would be too glossy and look like it is, uh, I don't know, marble or something like that, which is, which is highly polished. And this is not really, in my opinion, it's not realistic enough. So 51% of blurriness is fine. And yeah, that looks okay. So to create such a thing, it's quite easy on one hand. Let's have a look at these stages. To have this result really good, I needed several textures. The one thing is I have the complete map on one hand. Yeah, where we have this color inside and stuff like that. We have also structures and uh, stuff like that. But on top, I need to have the ambient occlusion to give it a bit more accent, especially here in the corners. Then on top, the normal map to have a bit of, yeah, let's say structure um, on the ground. Then on top, I'm putting now an emissive. This emissive texture is just the lighting of that whole thing. And you see, whenever we check these here, it's a base texture. It's a base texture. It's a normal map. It's an emissive. And then I have a secondary emissive applied on top to have more structure on that using the operation to multiply. That guy, the result is that it dims a cer a certain parts of the overall texture here. This one would look too bright, even though we have the lighting, the shadowing and everything here now on the ground. Yeah, keep an eye on that. Here we have lighting, there, there are some lighting informations. So, but this gives an overall nicer look, like concrete, like a concrete floor. So I added this emissive one here, but not too bright. I changed the amount to be 25%. If I write, write, rise it up like this, it would be too much. So that's the idea. Change the amount values a bit, adjust them. In the end, it is quite easy to get these things done. Another cool thing is, in this case, you can adjust most of the softwares, um, 3D softwares or the tools to use different UV channels. With Ventus, you have the advantage that you have two UV channels. You have UV0 and UV1. Whenever I create and bake these textures, I'm probably using UV channel one for these UV mapping informations. The simple reason is whenever I'm adding now something like a substance material or let's say a detail texture, yeah, um, I want to have it repeated or wrapped or whatever else, um, then I can use the default zero channel for that. Um, also shadow calculations and all that stuff can go in the very first uh, channel on top of this standard material than all the standard UV channel. This is always a quite good idea to put these pre-baked stuff in the UV1 and have all the other texture up, um, channels free or the first one free for such operations. Another thing to mention is that I used a secondary, uh, a copy of this floor with slightly different settings, which is everything to black, except the opacity, which is 5.2. The reason for that is, have a look at this shadow. I'm just adding a bit more of darkness to this shadow while I'm using that. Because I told the directional light, these settings, it's a 4K texture we are creating. It's per default um, set like the ambient and diffuse color, diffuse color. I said the direction to match a bit the original sun direction. Um, do we see here it is? So that the sun comes 
from that direction there from the top and goes to the lower left now. So that matches barely the same thing where the sun position is. But if I wouldn't use that, it is not, not enough um, intensity for the shadows. So even if I would, and this is another hand, even if I would use 1000% amount of shadow. You see, that makes no real difference. In it's not dark enough, in my opinion. So by using um, uh, the option on the material, just a second here. To have the shadow to alpha, I'm really adding just the shadow to alpha. That's the reason why I set everything to black and change the opacity to 5.8. If it would have 100% opacity, it would look like that. Well, that's way too much. So I adjusted it lower just to give it a bit of boost in the shadowing. It cannot be too much because the environment is still bright enough. And this element is not here directly at the windows and stuff like that. So that's the reason why I just used 5.8, 5.4 in this case. So uh, yeah, that's the idea why I used a second floor. I mean, this is a reference. Um, and another material where I said, hey, put the shadow to alpha, use the black colors, 5.4% uh, percent of it, and that's quite good. So one thing you would be missing right now is using um, an external light. So let's use a point light. We have set that here somewhere in the middle. So this will affect the ground. But as you see, this guy is not affecting my walls. It affects clearly the ground, but not the walls. How it comes? The materials for the walls are set to no light. That means they are 100% emissive right now. The complete map here goes to the base channel. We have the normal map and we have the speculum. So we have a bit of colorization done already by the base color texture, but it will not be affected anymore by the lighting. And this is the bad thing you would say, right? I can tell you there is a worker. I'm using this one here. It was a reference from, from another set we've been creating. And the trick is not to change the point light. Yeah, as you see here, that works. Um, you have not to change the point light, no. You need to take care about the materials which are used and baked by your tool. So, and uh, the way how you use the materials. We have a skybox that lets the environment, which is a simple cube map. I'm grabbing here a cube map. This cube is just for orientation that I know where the camera for the cube map grabber is. Yeah. So um, we have a cube map that get, get rendered. Um, we are grabbing this cube map now for the skybox. So you see the binding here in the content area. We bound the cube map to the skybox. So the skybox is now um, creating a specular by using this cube map from our cool environment we have here, which is just some blobs. Then we have these textures applied to that object. If I wouldn't have any kind of texture, you see it's just like grayish walls. Then I render it out in my 3D software, the shadows map, which is this one, and the diffuse lighting, which is the lighting map. So the colorization of these lights. I'm not using the base channel. I'm not using the diffuse channel. I'm using the diffuse light channel. Why do I do so? Now we're gonna really, I'm gonna kill your mind now. <laughs> This is how the 3D engine is working, how the light, the material and the lighting is handled by Ventus. When you look at this diagram, it's quite easy, guys. 
to be honestly, our developer, uh, he calls this map the diagram from hell, <laughs> because um, sometimes I need to stare at this picture or this diagram also for a while to understand what's happening while with one with one pixel right now and why is the lighting not, not correctly handled or whatever else. Um, it's worth to have a look into the user's manual, into the material part of the user's manual um, to get the basic understanding of our material system. It was not so much work to create this page, I tell you. Uh, while okay, to be honest, it was weeks and it's still maintained and so on and so on. So there's a lot of useful information in how to handle materials, how the material notes work and so on and so on. In the end, here's an explanation how the material system in Ventus works, the engine internally works. And this gives you a clue whenever we would have a look at the diffuse light and the diffuse part, for example. Here you see that these diffuse light get multiplied, then added the lighting and shadows, and then the rest goes on. When you have a look at the diffuse, you don't see that the light and the shadows are affecting that early enough to be taken into account. So when I would use here this guy as a diffuse texture, this will happen. Target, diffuse, multiply. It's just darkening up the whole thing. Cool. And whenever I use the light, we have this result. But whenever the light is off, it falls back to the default now, but whenever the light is off position, for example, yeah, it's, it's off screen here. Where is the lighting information to be baked into the texture? It's gone because it's not, it has not been lit by any kind of dynamic light source. And this is what we don't want. We want to have our material use and have its own lighting. Therefore, we choose to have this not as applied as a diffuse texture. This is applied as a diffuse light texture. It lits up the whole thing. And the same goes for the color. So diffuse lighting multiplied. And the color is applied to that thing. But the advantage is I can now use my light source and have it traveling around here and it will affect the wall during transition. And this is what we really want. The good thing is on top, we can have a substance. So I'm just enabling profound in the substance. You see that the lighting is still working with the substance. We can do whatever kind of substance we want. Yeah, let's do it like this. So we have like a concrete tiling wall. Yeah, you can see the here in the corner. There is colored lighting. Um, but also when we move the point light, this affects the substance on top. And the bad thing is it works with color as well. The range and the gain plays a role for that. All these things can be used now in conjunction with the pre-lit environment. And this is how you would use these things for a VR set, for example. You can create the complete studio, the complete VR set in your 3D tool, bake out the textures, render them with cool lighting situations, static in this case. But on top, you can use the dynamic lights from Ventus and add a nice look and feel. I know. This takes a lot of time, but not only in Ventus, this takes also a lot of time in the 3D application, but this is how we do it. Um, I mean, even if you're using other engines like Unreal, Unity or whatever else, let's take Unreal. You would use the same way. You would create and model the stuff in your 3D application if you are not happy with the primitives you have there already. And if you're not buying the assets, you can also buy assets from any kind of store and import that into Ventus. This is not a problem. But basically, 
when you have your, your Unreal Engine, you would create the asset in your 3D application. Then you would on top uh, try to texturize it, or in my case, I would just light it, um, how it should look like, and then go over to Unreal and then use the asset there. In Unreal, you would materialize it completely there and so on and so on. You would say, yeah, yeah, cool, I can use substances or whatever else or dynamic textures and stuff like that. Yes, but until a given point, because then you have to start with Swarm and render out the light situation, which is basically the same as if you're using Solidus Max or Cinema 4D, baking the textures. And then on top of that, then you can use a dynamic light. If you're honest, you would understand that you have also a limitation by using dynamic lights in any kind of other 3D engine. So um, there are areas in the games, I mean, these games are mostly linear. So there are areas in the games where you don't have uh, don't dynamic light for a reason. There are areas where you can use freely and dynamic light for a reason. So the same goes for Ventus. You can also do the same things in Ventus. But you have to keep in mind that this thing, this Ventus is not a linear engine. It's more like you would use that for camera tracking systems uh, together with camera tracking systems for a VR set and so on and so on. And I'm pretty sure if you are a good designer, you can design also good things in Ventus, pretty sure. So aside from that, these are the most interesting tips I can hand out now for handling uh, the materials and vendors and so on. Um, you can see that you can create nice stuff by using things like I did here with the avalanche. Um, so I used to have 3D mountains, a nice texture for these mountains. And I'm creating this avalanche which goes down the mountains. Looks stunning in the first, looks volumetric, but this is complete fake. If you look closer, these are just um, parts of the same mountains, uh, a bit extruded and a bit with noise on the 3D tool. And then I applied on top a video animated texture. But from the distance, it looks quite good. Another thing here is my so-called snowball. Um, it's more like a snow globe. So the particle system is now building up because we just started the scene. Then we have these uh, flashes of the thunder uh, randomly appearing and randomly changing the positions. This is one thing I wanted to show you how to uh, handle this. And this is my thunder point, <laughs> um, which has just a random position between an area here and the animation for the light for the game is also handled by a simple animation. So when we have a look at the animation here, it's something like, oh, this is my thunder point. It just uh, changes the gain and the white of the diffuse and very quickly I must admit, and therefore you have these flashes then it waits wait waits wait waits and then it goes back the same way and flashes up the omni light or the point light and that creates the illusion of having uh this the thunder appearing in the clouds the good thing is with the clouds this is part of the system related but i think it's good to know um the clouds have their own material, um, so that they react better to, to the uh, thunder. Um, let's see, we have the material here. A slightish uh, emissive amount is here. Two times I'm using the base, on top I'm using the emissive. And yeah, a slow, uh, uh, a very low opacity because usually this would be clouds like this and this is way too dense. So by lowering that to a very, 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 very low level, you see that there are enough particles um, to, that can create then a more random cloudy look. So this is the idea behind this particle system. And on the other hand, if you have the opacity too high, you see that 
they really add up to be quite very quite fast to be bright and over bleeding We have another thing which could be quite interesting, which is the refraction. There is a traditional way of creating refractions with Ventus by using a render target and using some kind of um, H, uh, HSL shader code. So, and that creates this kind of refraction. Yeah, you can have it, but there's an easier way to create refractions nowadays in Ventus. Uh, I, I wonder this topic has gone down under and nobody was really uh, amazed about because you are used to refractions from other engines. But for Ventus, this is quite interesting and quite too cool. So have a look at the snapshot node. Go for the interactive example for the snapshot and have a look at the snapshot frame buffer at once. I just want to point that out. This could be quite interesting for you because this node does not need another 3D layer, a layer reference layer. This one works out of the box without having a render target somewhere here. So you can change as well the, uh, the, the Fresnel effect. Uh, you can change it here. Like you see, so you have quite a lot of code, quite a lot of examples already shipped with Ventus to create a nice working Fresnel effect. Um, I would suggest you to just have a look at this example, play around a bit with it, and maybe that's enough for you and that's what you needed. Um, so far, so good. If you have any more questions right now, please drop them in the chat or write us a little mail or line. Um, we are always happy to answer your questions at support at ventus.com. Uh, anyway, you should also have a look at our website if you need more details. If you want to have a quote for the software, please drop salesadventus.com a line. If you found this webinar useful, drop a line to trainingadventus.com, infoadventus.com, drop me a line. Join our Discord. We have a Discord server, with a, which is discord.ventus.com. I feel like an advertisement guy right now to advertise all the addresses and pages. But another thing to mention is we have soon um, um, a, a kind of, uh, let's say not dev talk, it's more like uh, uh, you can ask, ask the content creators and the supporters questions regarding Ventus. Um, this will be the whole team like uh, Daniel, Steven, Gertz, Jan, um, Frederick, me, maybe one or two devs will join us and we will have a, like a face to face session. We will start um, like uh, with Ring Central, a small session and broadcast that here in the GoToWebinar. You can ask us directly questions relating to the software. Please do not ask questions about bugs or hardware related stuff. This will be just about. Uh, yeah, overall handling inventors. If you need a tip or trick or a bit of project related stuff, we are happy then to answer these questions. Um, we will announce that soon and you will have enough time to write down some questions. It will work in the same way we are working right now so that you have the option to drop the questions uh, here directly to us. We will take them, pick them and try to answer them. You, we will also enable the audio chant chat so that you can ask your question by voice. So if you raise your hand, we will then uh, pick you and we will answer. Yeah. You have the HDR engine enabled. You have an access. You have a skybox. A skybox is always useful, by the way. Um, you have a sphere. Um, then. 
get an irradiance to have the lighting for your elements. Pictures. Uh, here we have the irradiance. There's a specular. So irradiance creates another lighting for us. In this case, since you don't have any other light, but you have the skybox as a lighting source, disable the default light. Now this uh, this sphere is lit by the skybox because we are using the irradiance. Then I'm adding on top a specular and using a specular texture should be the same. This one here. And we add now a material and look what happens as soon as I add the material to the sphere. Nothing, but when I change it to phone. As soon as I change it to phone, it will automatically have the specularity level up uh, at, uh, which is high like white and therefore we have now a reflection from the environment automatically set to that so that looks like this element is um, like a I don't know what because the base color is included so whenever I use to lower the base color you have uh, now 100% of the reflection of the environment applied to that sphere you can now use the roughness and adjust the roughness of the material. Better to see if you disable the skybox. So here with the roughness slider, you're basically changing the reflection clearness, the glossiness of the sphere. Even though if you are nearly the end, there is something very interesting you should know about um, the image-based lighting stuff. Sorry for that, that it's so late now, but um, you get the inter interactive example for image-based lighting here. And that can be used to get a basic understanding for image-based lighting. We have two different, we have found out that we have just two different types of materials existing right now for us physically. The ones are conductive and the other ones are non-conductive objects. So conductive objects is like clear, plain metal objects. And the others are like plastic, like coal, like I don't know what, um, and everything that has a code for basically, yeah. So for our eye, for our perception, it's like whenever you change the base color of an object, just the base color, it looks like plastic or something in between or rubber or what else, yeah. These are the non-conductive objects. They have a bit of glossiness, right? So let's lower that bit down. They can have a bit of glossiness, but you see the reflection of the environment is colorized, so with the color of the environment. And on top added of the base color. So this is what I changed. I changed here just the base color. You see, whenever I'm changing the color, it looks for you like plastic balls, or something like that. Right? But what happens if I'm changing the base color to be grayish or black? Just a bit brighter because the stream is very cropped. And I'm changing the specular color now. You see the difference? This looks like a metal ball. So it's it's conductive, more or less conductive. Whenever I change the color, the perception for it from your eyes is more like, ah, this is a metallic object. Um, whenever you change these colors for the specularity and have no base color, it is for us, like a metallic object. Whenever we are changing the base color, but not the specularity, just a level, for us it's plastic, rubber, or whatever else. This is just as a side note that you um, that you get the idea about image-based lighting and how the perception from us is when we handle this, these textures. So keep in mind, whenever you're adjusting textures, like a specular texture or a base color, what does it affect really? Because when I'm mixing up these colors now, we have the base color set to red. I'm having the specular color set to something like this. This make no sense. For our eye, this, this makes no sense now. It looks funny, but it has nothing to do with the real material. You know what I mean? This can look funny here where it is blurred up or where it is rough. So from an artistic perspective, 
yes, you can do it. But when you are creating and trying to recreate physically image-based looking correctly materials, this would not work. Sometimes I'm using that for this platinum feeling for gold or whatever else. Um, then I'm using these tricks, to be honest. Yeah, but this depends on the scene. This, this depends on how the look should look like. It should be like. This will not work here, here, but here it's fine, and there, and there it's fine. So in this area, there it starts to be fine. But for the rest, it makes no sense to have these colors. And you see the colors are very close together. 